All right, I want to talk to you about the sin of unbelief. I saw some uh, brethren going back and forth on this whole thing with the uh, free grace people or easy believism, whatever you want to call them. And the uh, easy believism people um, basically goes back to Jack Hiles. He was the one that really perpetuated a lot of this stuff because Jack Hiles was all about uh, getting people in the pews and getting their money. He was uh, one of the biggest lying con, art con artists ever out there. I have a whole series of videos debunking the guy showing that he was just a wicked hypocrite. And uh, he was all about numbers, boy. He, we're the largest Baptist church, and we're the we get more people saved in our bus ministry, is all this other stuff. He was about numbers. Um, I don't mean numbers, the book of the Bible. Okay, <laughs> he was about uh, getting people in there and getting their money. And uh, so he came up with this thing, and he said that there's no there's no such thing as repentance of sin. It's about repentance means a, a change from unbelief to belief. You don't believe in Jesus dying for your sins and then you believe. That's all there is to it. Just belief. You know, there's no repentance of sin. Well, that's a problem because uh, unbelief in the Bible is a sin. So if you want to say that you have to turn from unbelief, you're saying that you have to turn from sin. Let's look at the scriptures. Matthew chapter 13. Get a King James Bible. Don't just sit there looking at me. Get a King James Bible. Pause the video. Go get a King James Bible and look at the scriptures. Okay? Get into the habit of doing that. This is preaching. This is not entertaining. This is not some kind of a, a neat video and all of a sudden there's going to be wild graphics coming down or all kinds of background music or whatever else. You know, you get a little bit of an intro there at the beginning of this video, but this is a preaching video, teaching from the Word of God, the King James Bible. Okay? The reason you get a King James Bible is to make sure that I'm not lying to you. Look at the scriptures for yourself. People are just too passive nowadays. They just want to sit at the computer just, or sit there at your iPhone or whatever, looking at the thing. You know, get a King James Bible. And I don't mean an app or something Bible. Get a print King James Bible. All right? Matthew chapter 13. Verse 53 through 58. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence. And when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And his sisters are not they all with us? Once then hath this man these all these things. Why, Mary, just, I got to sidetrack here for a minute. Mary, she had at least six other children besides Jesus? Whatever happened to the uh, perpetual virginity of Mary? Uh, not a very good perpetual virgin goddess, was she? Uh, no, but she was a fine Christian woman. Okay, <laughs> mother and wife to Joseph. Catholics try to make her into a goddess, and she's not. Verse 57. But they were offended in him, and but Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And then he did, and he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Is unbelief a sin? Yes. So in order to be saved, you have to repent of unbelief. Repent of unbelief. Sin. Hmm. You say, but, but we're going to get to the other arguments, things we're going to get to other stuff. I'm going to show you why they don't like the thing of saying repent of sin and how unbelief ties into actual sins of the flesh and things like that. I'm going to show you. I want to show you why these gospel perverts try to mess with what the Bible plainly teaches, the plan of salvation, the simplicity. You're a sinner. You've done things that have messed up your life. You know that. Okay? You can't save yourself. Jesus Christ died to save sinners. Do you want to change life? You see? You come to the Lord, come unto me, all, that, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, Jesus says. If you're a sinner, you will labor with your sin. You won't enjoy it. You'll say, I just wish I could help. Somebody needs to help me. or I wish I could just, you know? You come to Jesus Christ as a sinner. But you have people out there that love their sin, that enjoy their sinful life. And that's why they come up with this thing like Jack Hiles did. 
Jack Hiles conning people out of their money. Jack Hiles standing there preaching from the pulpit his mighty sermons. And he's got his wife back here behind him. And over here, Jenny Nishik, his secretary. And he's sleeping with both women. And his own daughter comes out and says about it. But they see, that's why you don't uh, talk about repenting of sin and talk about sins of the flesh and things like that. You got to kind of leave that stuff out. You just say turning from unbelief to belief. Well, uh, honey, unbelief is a sin. And there's a reason that people are in unbelief. We'll get to that. Matthew chapter 17, verses 14 through 21. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed. For oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? But, and Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. What was their unbelief based on? They didn't have faith. Can somebody be saved if they don't have faith? No. Um, can you be saved if you don't have faith that God can help you to, to, to you know, fix up your, chain, or your, uh, your messed up life? See, that's the whole thing. <laughs> you know, people want to say, well, I can have salvation just going to kind of continue on with what I'm doing here and I can just... Oh, uh, Jesus died for my sins? Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, what do I got to do? I'll believe it by faith? Okay, good. You don't even have to pray a prayer. You know, sometimes, you know, you just, you just don't ask God to save you. You just go, oh, okay, I believe it now. Do, 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 and you just go on about your life. Hmm. Mark chapter 6. We're going to go through all the different references to unbelief. Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. And when he went out from thence, and came into his own country, and his disciples follow him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, and of Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. Again, another passage kicking, this is a similar thing to what we read earlier in the book of Matthew, but again, another passage kicking the perpetual virginity of Mary, the false Mary of Roman Catholicism. Verse 4, But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his house. And he could, not, and he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went round about the villages teaching. Marveled because of their unbelief. Hmm. Mark chapter 16. Verse 14. Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. They didn't believe that Jesus came up from the dead. And that unbelief would have damned them, damned them if they would have continued in that. What's the gospel? Uh, the death, burial, and resurrection? Well, I believe that Jesus died and I believe that he was buried. Thank you. I'm saved. Goodbye. You know, uh, No, it doesn't work that way. Death, burial, resurrection. Your salvation is no good if Jesus just died. Not really any good either if he's just died and he buried. He has to be dead, buried, and resurrected. You see, because that's what's going to save you. The wages of sin is death. You're going to die. You're going to get buried. But are you going to be resurrected? You see? 
So the disciples are there early on and they're going, I don't really know about this resurrection thing. I don't really know. And Jesus told them before, you know, just not that long ago, you know, a week ago, he's, he's saying to them, yeah, I'm going to die. I'm going to be buried. I'm going to come up the third day. A couple days later, I don't think it happened. I don't think it's true. A couple people come in. Hey, we just saw him. Jesus, you know, I just saw Jesus. Eh, I don't know. That's just your opinion. You know, <laughs> Unbelief. It's unbelief. Romans chapter 3. Turn to Romans chapter 3. Verses 1 through 4. What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Your unbelief is not going to make the faith of God, there it says, without effect. The Jews say, well, no, we don't believe that he's our Messiah. Oh, okay, I guess he's not then. <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way. Their unbelief does not make the faith of God without effect. Again, um, are they in sin for being unbelieving? Yes. They are in great sin. Then you could say that uh, unbelief is a sin. And if you want to say you've got to turn from unbelief to belief, then you are saying you have to turn from sin. Just as simple as that. But again, I'm going to show you why people think this way. Romans chapter 4, verses 16 through 25 Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that which all that excuse me, to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which he which be not as though they were who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He sna staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. And people will say, see, Abraham was saved by grace through faith, just like we are today. Uh, can you not read plain English? <laughs> um, he was not having faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the cross. He knew nothing about it. God said, hey, Abraham, you love me? Oh, of course I do, Lord. Okay, then go sacrifice your son. Oh, and uh, before that, actually, what the passage is talking about here, I'm going to give you a son. Abraham's going... You realize how old I am, Lord? This is kind of, you know, we've tried for all of our lives here, and uh, Sarah is kind of barren. She can't have children. The Lord says, I'm going to take care of it. Do you believe me? Okay. Yeah, I believe you. Then later on, he tests his faith again. Say it that way. Uh, it had nothing to do with Abraham looking forward to the cross. Okay, that's a satanic heresy taught by Catholics posing as Baptists. The new IFB, in other words. <clears throat> continue verse 22 and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up jesus our lord from the dead who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification delivered for our offenses he was killed for our offenses but you don't have to think about it or talk about it or be sorry for it apparently according to the heretics like Hiles and the free grace, easy believism crowd. You don't have to worry about your offenses. Jesus died for sin and sinners and sins, and th but just don't think about you, yourself being a sinner and the sins that you've done and whatever else. I mean, Jesus dies this terrible death. He's up there suffering for your sins, but you can just continue in those sins and not really want to talk about the sins and It's so warped. I've, I've, I, I, I think one of the biggest challenges as a Christian 
especially when you get into ministry, is you understand what the Bible says. You understand the Bible talks about how lost people think and why they think a certain way. And you, just like the Lord, you, you still look and you go, you just marvel at their unbelief. You think, how can't you see this? I mean, it's just, what? You, listen, you look at the heresies of these lost people and you just think, I know the Bible says that you people think this way and I know the Bible says why you think this way, whatever, but I just, I just marvel at this. How can somebody claim to be saved and yet where's the conviction of their sins? Where's the sorrow? Hey, Jesus is dying on the cross. He's, you know, he's in agony. Why? He's paying the price for what I've done. My horrible, wicked past. Jesus is there dying on the cross in agony. I'm going to be sorry for those sins. I want to turn from those sins. I don't want to live the rest of my life doing those things that he had to die for on that cross. But yet the free gracers just go, eh, that's work salvation. That's just this. And they come up with all this stuff and you just go, okay. I marvel at their unbelief. You say unbelief, they believe in the cross. They don't believe that they're sinners. They don't believe in accountability for their sins. They believe they can just continue. Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, verse 19 through 23. Thou wilt say, then the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell. Severity, but toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And, these, and they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. You say, wait a second, I thought unbelief gets you cut off. Well, it does in the sense of right now. In the church age, yeah, they're cut off. The Jews are cut off from, from the promises of God and everything else. God brought them back to their nation, but that's prophesied back in the book of Ezekiel. But as far as God's blessing and things and God saving them, a Jew dies in their unbelief, they go to hell. But God brings them back into his system in unbelief. So, well, how? Because God made promises to Abraham and his seed. Physical seed. Okay? <laughs> Not replacement theology, Catholic nonsense. God made a promise. And that's what Romans chapter 11 is all about there. Okay? But God's going to bring them back in unbelief. He's going to graft them in again. But uh, it's not going to be without pain. You don't reject Jesus Christ as a nation, as your Messiah, and the Lord just says, oh, well, you know, I'll let you go for a few thousand years and eventually we'll just come back, just bless you and just wonderful. Uh, the time of Jacob's trouble is a very horrible, vicious time. Um, as I said in one of my recent studies, over 90%, probably over 95% of the world's population is going to die in that time period. Uh, you know, a lot of the modern scientists are starting to call it a mass extinction event is coming soon. <laughs> yeah, it's called the book of Revelation, you know, okay? Um, it's not extinction either. You know, there will be some that get saved, that are saved through that time period, but it's going to be rough. It's going to be very, very rough. Um, God is going to whip the nation of Israel, the time of Jacob, you know, Israel's trouble. Uh, it's, going to be, it's going to be bad for him. But let's continue here. Uh, verse 30. Go down to verse 30. For as ye, as ye in times past have now not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Again, uh, the Jews, if they had accepted Jesus as their Messiah, God wouldn't have dealt with the Gentile nations. This little time period that we're in here is a very special time where you can become a member of the body of Christ. Um, God's dealing with the Gentiles because of the Jews' unbelief. They didn't believe that he was their Messiah. So because of that, the Lord starts to deal with the Gentiles, and then he provokes the Jews to jealousy through that and through their unbelief. He brings them back in, in their unbelief. Again, the biggest reason that replacement theology baffles 
they reject the Jews as being God's chosen people because the Jews reject Jesus Christ. And yet you just read the Bible and you go, they're brought back in unbelief. You know? We would believe that the Jews are legitimate if they all believed in Jesus. They reject Jesus, so we reject them. Uh, if they believed in Jesus, how could they be brought back in unbelief? <laughs> Again, you marvel. You go, I don't get it. It's just so plain. You just read the Bible. It's right there. But continue. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. First Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Okay? Uh, Paul was un in unbelief there as a lost man, but uh, unbelief wasn't a sin, right? <laughs> Um, no, it was a sin. Persecutor, injurious, blasphemer. But he did it in unbelief. See? And, un, you know, repenting is just simply going from unbelief to belief. <laughs> I mean, just, again, these people, so insane. Unbelief is a sin. Unbelief leads to multiple sins. Okay? And I would say that the reason that you do all the wicked sins, the reason that lost people do all the wicked sins, is because it's all because of unbelief. Unbelief is at the top, and everything that you do is underneath it. If you believe God, if you believe the Bible, you're not going to do those things. Why do you do those wicked things then? Because of your unbelief. Yeah, you do need to repent of your unbelief. That includes a whole lot of other stuff. Hebrews chapter 3. Again, we're going through all the references to the word unbelief. That's why we're going to the book of Hebrews and a lot of other places here. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 through 19. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Hmm. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Is that true for a Christian today? No, not true for a Christian today. But compared to Matthew chapter 24, verse 13, you're not made a partaker of Christ today if you hold your confidence steadfast unto the end. You don't have to endure to the end to be saved. In other words, like Matthew 24, verse 13 says. But you do if you're a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble. And it's interesting because Romans 11 says, God brings them back in unbelief. And here you have the book written to Hebrews, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. They're brought back in unbelief, and, and the instruction for a Jew in that time, take heed about that heart of unbelief that you have. You better start believing. Verse 15, While it is said, Today if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some when they had heard did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? Believed not? What is that? Unbelief? So we see then, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Why did they have unbelief? Because they wanted the pleasures of sin for a season. They remembered what was going on back in Egypt and they said, I wish I had that again. Boy, life sure was good back there. That's why they had unbelief. Sin in your life leads to unbelief. So I don't believe. Well, okay. <laughs> Sorry, can't help you. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 6. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, they, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. 
There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. <laughs> right there, unbelief is a sin, just as plain as day. So what's the conclusion of the matter? Go back to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 16 through 21. Because this is certainly one that uh, a lot of lost people would quote and know about and whatever else. I mean, I used to say that years ago, and I'd hear more lost people talking about, you know, John three sixteen. you know. Um, now people are so hardened uh, because of their unbelief. You know, people are so just wicked and just, oh, my word, it's terrible. America is becoming a heathen nation. The, the world is becoming just totally heathen and, and wicked, and most people don't even know John 3.16 anymore. But uh, let's, let's see what the Bible says here. Remember, this whole free grace, easy believism thing says all it is is just turning from unbelief to belief. There's no changed life. There's no, I'm really sorry for my sins. I, I repent of my sins and whatever else. That's not there. Remember that as we read this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Okay? Is that true? Absolutely. You say, well, all we see is belief. That's all we see. Just belief. Keep reading. He that believeth on him is not condemned. Okay? But he that believeth not. What is it when somebody believeth not? Unbelief. He that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And why do they do that? And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. You mean to tell me unbelief is a direct result of their deeds being evil? And the thought of a changed life is repulsive to them? Yeah. Verse 20. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. You know, people say, you believe in works salvation. Denlinger teaches works salvation. He's a lordship salvationist and things like this because I tell people that your life is going to change after salvation. And they say, uh, you're, you're, you know, this is works. He's teaching works. He's cleaning up his life and whatever else. Oh, oh, honey, child, let me tell you something. I don't clean up my life. God cleans up my life. Since I've gotten saved, you go back to when I first got saved, I was doing some really wicked stuff. And God comes along and he says, that has to stop. I used to be a video game addict when I first got saved. And the Lord said, what is this? Is this expedient? Is this helping you to study the Bible better and, and understand scripture and whatever else? Uh, well, no, Lord, get rid of it. You think it was my will? You think it was my thing to say, oh, you know, I'm going to get rid of a uh, video game playing and I'm going to get out of debt and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to this and I'm going to that and whatever the process of sanctification is God working in the life of the believer. God convicting of sin and saying, get that thing out of your life right now. Why? He that doeth truth cometh to the light. You open up this book and you start reading this book and all of a sudden, ouch. That book says right there, oh, uh, that right, ooh, uh, well, I'm, okay, Lord, well, I, I guess I'm kind of doing that. I, well, okay, I am doing that, but, but I know other Christians, and the Lord says, you need to stop. But I know other, you need to stop, or I'm going to chase you, son. My word says it. You're coming to the light, aren't you? Your deeds have just been reproved, son. Change. Now. And I can't tell you how many times I just flat out disobeyed the Lord and the Lord chastened me. 
I have scars to prove it, okay? Uh, there were many times I, I didn't give up my sin after being saved. I fought. It isn't about Brian Denley or doing good works to get saved and to maintain my salvation or whatever. Oh, honey, no. I was born again and God bought me with His blood. And now God owns me and He has a right to get into my personal business and into your personal business if you're saved, he has a right to get in there and say, that needs to stop. That needs to go. You need to quit doing that. And that's why a lot of people don't want to get saved. They don't want God in their personal business. They don't want to become a slave, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Take my yoke upon you, the Lord Jesus Christ says, how would you like a leather collar put around your neck and a chain and going up there to the Lord and the Lord's leading you through the world? And you're there and you're just walking along behind the Lord and He says, this way, okay, this way. That's the picture that the Lord Jesus Christ gives of a Christian. It isn't a thing of, of okay, what can I get out of this? Hey, what do I get? Into? You come to the Lord broken. You're standing there ashamed of yourself. And the Lord says, I'll buy you. But if I buy you, I'm going to tell you what to do. You're going to be my bondservant. Your life is not your own if I buy you. You take me, a dog, a filthy, disgusting, wicked, vile individual like me, God, you'd take me? Really? You died on the cross for my sins? You'll, you'll, you'll give me a new life? Yeah. Please, God, please. I'll do anything. I'll, please, God, save me. That's biblical salvation. All these liars that come out there and they say, you don't need to do all that stuff. You can't possibly repent of all your sins. How could you remember everything ever that you've ever done that's considered a sin? You don't have to repent of all your sins. All you have to do is just go from unbelief to belief. You believe he died on the cross, say this prayer, you're in. Boom, you're done. Go on back to living your life. Be the mega preacher up there that cons the suckers out of their money. That pridefully stands in the pulpit. Jack Hiles standing in the pulpit and his wife here and his mistress here. And just looking down at those people and just going conning every single one of you suckers. Keep sending me that money. I'll just keep pounding it in your face 10%. If you don't love God, you're not going to... You know, the whole thing. Wicked, wicked, wicked man. And yet a lot of his followers are still around. A lot of the people that follow that perverse gospel. Why? Why? Everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. I don't like these preachers that preach on sin. Why? Because you hate the light. That's the whole issue here. That's why these people try to say that you don't, you don't dare say about you have to repent of sin. And they've, they've just, they just browbeat you if you're a Bible-believing Christian, if you believe the true gospel. You come to the Lord as a broken sinner. They'll just beat you and beat you and beat you and beat you and just use all these little philosophical arguments and just keep on hammering you and hammering you and hammering you to where you're so ashamed of yourself and you're saying, well, I didn't mean to follow into Lordship Salvation. I, I guess I'm Lordship Salvation. I don't even know what Lordship Salvation is. It's not in the Bible, but you know they come up with these terms and things. And I guess I'm, I, I, I didn't mean to teach this false doctrine and, and, and whatever. Or you get ashamed and you say, I'm not going to follow Brother Brian's ministry anymore because so-and-so said he teaches Lordship Salvation and I don't want to be associated and whatever else, you know. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, that's going to be it for this study. Um, uh, like I said, I think the, the, the thing the Lord has shown me the most over the years of being in ministry, full-time ministry, is just how he would marvel at people's unbelief. And I do the same thing. I'm not Jesus. I'm not God manifest in the flesh, not even close.
but I marvel sometimes at these people. I think to myself, somebody can be right on the Bible version issue and they can be right on all these other things and yet you hear their gospel and it's this perverse, no repentance of sin. They're just, they're just this free grace. You don't got to ask God to save you. You don't have to come as a sinner. You don't, you're not, they have to be broken. You don't change your life after you get saved. Or I marvel. I marvel at that. And I always will. I just don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. Your eternity is at stake. You're going to go to hell if you believe that. Why are you gambling with your soul? Why? If you're wrong, you're going to hell. Don't you get that? And brethren, you just got to get to a point, I guess, sometimes where you just say, you know what? There's people out there that they're earning their damnation right now. And there's not a thing you can do for them. That's it. So, that's going to be it for this study. Uh, don't get discouraged, brethren. Stand by the Word of God. Stand by the true gospel. The true gospel that produces a changed life. God working in the life of a Christian. Not that you're changing it, you're doing whatever else, good works and things like this. Work salvation is ex it excludes Jesus Christ. And it's all about your own fleshly little things that don't even appear in Scripture like the Catholics do. Saying the rosary and going on holy pilgrimages to Rome and, and all these little good, nice things that they do and communitarian type of projects. That's good works. That's work salvation. Confessing to the priest, auricular confession and all that. That's what work salvation is. A Bible-believing Christian that gets saved and God comes into their life and starts to change them. You know? That's not work salvation. That's biblical salvation. God changes you. He owns you. He bought you with a price. So, that's going to be it. Uh, I think that's it. Okay. Uh, we will see you in the next video. And thank you to all those who support the ministry. And, uh, and I'm going to start putting at the end of the videos. I'm going to try to remember to do this. I want to put, you know, the KingJamesVideoMinistries.com and KingJamesVideoMinistries.org. A brother created the, you know, the companion website there. And there's forums and all kinds of other stuff. I don't have time to do all that with my website. So uh, you can go on over and check that website out. And um, again, we thank you for your prayers and your support. That's going to be it, and we will see you in the next video.